So we're going to sing an action song today. So there's three different actions. Can you clap your hands? Yes. Can you stomp your feet? Can you say amen? Amen. amen. All right. Everybody, please join with us. I think you already know which song this is going to be. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will show it. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, do you all three? Stop, stop. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, do you all three? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've been at work during the Bible times, but also the way that you've been at work in the time since the Bible was written. We thank you for the work that you did in renewing the church through Martin Luther. We thank you for the work that you've done over and over again as people have lost the focus on your love and your grace, or people have lost a clear picture of who you are. Lord, thank you for your continually renewing the church. And we pray that you would renew us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, we jump to the third of the three movements that I, I explored this summer. And as I said, the reason I did these explorations was that since our church mission statement is, see if you can remember, connecting upward, outward. connecting inward, and outward, outward that I wanted to look at places in church history where the church has been renewed, where they sort of lost their ability to connect upward, in, inward, and outward, and the Spirit has gotten a hold of them and moved them in powerful ways to restore those things. So I looked at the 1700s in Germany with a bunch of Bohemian refugees coming up to a, a count's estate and how they, the Moravians, would end up turning the world upside down beginning in the 1700s. And then we looked at a Norwegian peasant farmer in the 1800s named Hans Nielsen Hauge, who would turn Norway upside down religiously, politically, socially in the 1800s. But that's over there, that's back then. We want to get a little bit closer to home. So today was one, I didn't do any traveling, I didn't go to San Francisco or Los Angeles or places where these things happen. But this is one that's a little closer to home both in time and location. And it happened about the same time, a year after I was born. <laughs> But it happened at a time that was pretty unlikely. So if you want to go to the second slide up there, the next one. When do you think would be a pretty unlikely time for a revival to break out? An unlikely place for a revival to break out? An unlikely group of people for a revival to break out in? Do you think possibly San Francisco in 1967 could be an unlikely time for a revival to begin? But yet, God shows up in unexpected places at unexpected times. So that's exactly where, if you look at the effect of church growth in the last 51 years, the greatest renewal that's happened in the United States happened starting in San Francisco in 1967, in the, in the group that we would describe as the hippies. And we're going to take some time this week, next week, and the week after to learn about this, this thing that's happened closer to us in our country. Go to the next one. The reason that I wanted to explore this was, at that time, how was culture? Was it nice and peaceful and everyone was happy and there was no protests and no things going on where people were... Was it a nice, peaceful time for those? I was only one or two, so I don't remember much. <laughs> but do you think that if God could break into that time in culture where it really would end up changing the culture for the next 20 or 30 years because of what God did through this renewal. Do you think we might possibly be at a time in our country's history where there's a little bit of unrest? 
a little bit of dissatisfaction, a little bit of anger and frustration going on, that maybe we might need to ask God to do the same kind of thing in our day and age. Because to me, it's looking like an unlikely time for revival to break in as we're just busy fighting with each other and angry and things are falling apart. But that's when God shows up. So in Habakkuk, Habakkuk says to God, Lord, I've heard your fame, I stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day, in our time, make them known. So my prayer as we go through this section is to pray, God, you showed up among the hippies in an unlikely time, an unlikely place 51 years ago. Show up now. We in our society need you. So that brings us to where did this whole Jesus people revival, renewal come from? Do you go to the next one? And it's actually pretty quiet. The way that it begins is just one woman going to church faithfully at the Baptist Church in Mill Valley, California. One woman who has some drug issues, is going through some challenging times in her marriage, but yet she's finding a place in a church that receives her where she can learn about Jesus. That's the beginning of the Jesus People movement. One woman in one small church. But what ends up happening is this woman, as she's transformed by the community of the church, hearing about Jesus, is, you can go to the next one, she prays for her husband who's much more messed up than she is. He's the guy on the left, his name is Ted Wise, the woman's name is Liz Wise. And Ted is someone who, when he was in the military, he ended up having, going on leave in Japan, and in Japan he discovered some drugs. So he ended, for those of you that are in the military, was that common that people would discover drugs on leave, possibly back in that day and age? He did. In Japan he ended up getting into heroin, into marijuana, and when he came back, he ended up spiraling downward. He ended up getting more and more involved in LSD and whatever was going on at that time. And he actually got to the point where he was so messed up that he was planning on killing his wife. Apparently his life was a little bit messed up. But the prayers of his wife, Liz, I think ended up doing something. I know they ended up doing something. We can go to the next one. He ended up coming to a place where he started to evaluate his life and realizing that something was going wrong. And as he looked at his life, this was his quote, looking for the prince on the throne but discovered only the rat in the basement. That was his evaluation of his life at that time, wondering what was going on. But yet at the same time as he saw how messed up he was, he looked at his wife, Liz, and he said when she came home from church it was like she was just glowing. There was something different about her. So it got his attention. It didn't cause him to go to church, but it did cause him to want to read the Bible to learn about what this message was that was changing his wife's, wife's life. So he started reading, especially the New Testament. You go to the next one. As he read the New Testament, he was especially interested in the book of Acts, and that's going to be a big part of what will shape the Jesus People movement, is the message of Jesus and the message of the early church. So as he read the book of Acts, he came across another guy who was pretty messed up and destructive. His name was Saul. And as Saul was on his way to be destructive as he went to Damascus, Saul would have an experience of Jesus on the road to Damascus. So Ted Wise, as he reads about the story of Saul, he's going to have his own little encounter. And um, so we're just going to read what he wrote. Well, on my way to my, and I'll, I'll edit the second part. On the way to my own Damascus, I found it necessary to cry out to God to save my life in every sense of the word. Jesus knocked me off my metaphysical donkey. I could choose him or literally suffer a fate worse than death. Who was reading the Bible after his wife had prayed for him and modeled what it looked like to be transformed by Jesus, that this movement starts to take some momentum. So let's go to the next one. He, he and his wife start going around to parties telling their friends that they're now followers of Jesus and their friends don't really know what to do. But one Saturday night, after both of them take a hit of LSD, they go out and do some partying and they tell their friends about their faith and on their way back across the Bay Bridge, whether it's the LSD or other influences, he's, it's like he says that he has this vision of the bridge just all of a sudden starting to go straight up. And he starts hearing these demonic voices saying, it's time to flee, it's time to give up. But at the same time, he says he hears the audible voice of God saying, go to church tomorrow. And so that's what he writes in, in, his, in his journal. 
And that's what he does. He hasn't gone to church yet. He's just believed in Jesus based on reading the Bible. What a radical idea. Um, but he ends up going to church with his wife. We go to the next one. And as he goes to church at the end of the service there at the Baptist Church in Mill Valley, California, he goes up at the end and shares his testimony. And his testimony is so messed up, these nice Baptists have no idea how to handle what he's talking about. And they don't know what to do with it. But at the same time, if you look, go to the next one. Go to the green side. He also didn't know what to do with them. Because he said, these people didn't look at all like the people I had just read about in the book of Acts. Yeah. So that was his tension. This community that was blessing his wife still was not the fullness of what he was reading about in the Bible. So, you know the next one. He and his wife Liz would continue to go to the Baptist church and be blessed as part of that community. But they decided that they also needed to try to get together with other people in a smaller group setting that would help them to more fully live out what they saw in the book of Acts. So there were several friends of theirs who during the same time period were having their own personal encounters with Jesus and coming to faith. And there turned out to be four couples that would move in to a place where they would call it the House of Acts. And it would be in Novato, California, just outside of San Francisco. So in the House of Acts, these four new, new Christian couples would come together, they'd live together. I mean, that was part of the culture of the hippie movement, was communal living, it was something that was the thing to do. But yet it was also what they read about in the book of Acts. This is, they came together and they shared life together. And as they shared life together, they experienced more of God working in and through them. So this group of people, these four couples, they focus on worshiping. When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, what do you do? You start connecting upward with God in a more powerful way. You start focusing more on prayer and worship. And as they did that, they realized they needed to come together in community. They focused on good, solid Christian community. But what about that third dimension of living a full Christian life, connecting upward, connecting inward, and connecting outward? As they came together in their community of four couples, they also came to the conclusion that if we're going to live out the book of Acts, we can't just stay here in our house focusing on each other. We need to go out and be a blessing in the community. So these couples started making soup and sandwiches, and they started going into San Francisco. And this was the summer of love, 1967. And it turned out to be a time where some of those sandwiches and that soup was really important. And because as all of these hippies would start flooding into San Francisco, they got to the place where the infrastructure of San Francisco couldn't handle this huge influx. And people were getting hungry, and people were getting frustrated, and crime was going up, and people were being assaulted. And it was the place where they basically sent out a message, please, nobody else come to San Francisco. We can't handle more people here right now. So into the midst of that situation, these four couples went out and they started sharing sandwiches and soup. They had a little place called the living room uh, where they talked to people. And I guess they had interesting people that came through. I guess Charles Manson came through a few times, shared a little bit of inappropriate language as he ate some soup there. Um, but they were there in the middle of the community, there in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco. You can go to the next one. So that, that was their ministry. But as they lived out their Christian faith in community and, in the, and going out to serve the city in San Francisco, they also started to recognize other people. You can go to the next one. You probably don't realize this, but this guy may be the most influential person in church in the last 50 years other than Billy Graham, but you probably never heard of him before. We're going to learn more about him next week. But he was a hippie named Lonnie Frisbee. And this hippie we're going to talk about next week. But he is someone who is going to have an encounter while out doing his hippie thing in a canyon in Southern California. He has an encounter with God, and we're going to talk about that next week. And he's going to move up to San Francisco because he's a gifted artist and he has an art scholarship in San Francisco. But after his encounter with God, he is going to start preaching on the streets of San Francisco that summer, the same time that the people from the House of Acts are out there doing their outreach ministry. And so these couples see this young guy, and they think he's passionate, but his theology is really screwed up. So what they end up doing is they invite him into the community. They invite him to move into their house, and they mentor him. And as they mentor him, they start to straighten out some of his theology. 
And um, you're, we're going to find out that this, this person is going to be the one who's basically going to be the start of three movements. Part of the Jesus people, he's going to start the Calvary Chapel movement, he's going to start the Vineyard movement. Because of their investment in him at that time when he's trying to figure out what his faith is about. So with that, we're going to talk about him next week. But what I want to do is talk about what we learned about how this movement started and what it can tell us as a congregation that we need to be focusing on. So let's go to the next one. I think the first thing is just how it started. It didn't start with some big fancy program. It started with one faithful church ministering to one woman who came to church needing the love and the message of Jesus. So where do we start to be a renewal movement in, our con in this community? We start by loving the person who's here. We love the person who's sitting next to us in the pew. We recognize the person who comes in and visits. We take time to talk to them and to share with them. And what did she do as she came into the church? As she experienced the love of Jesus, she prayed for her husband. So a lot of it comes down to, you can go to the next one, big movements start with one person. That basically we start not by trying to transform the world, but we start by loving the person in front of us. Somebody loved Liz Wise in that church in Mill Valley, California, and it changed her, which ended up starting a chain reaction. And this was, I actually spent some time here several years ago with Heidi and Roland Baker, missionaries in Mozambique, and they have planted thousands of churches and care for thousands of orphans, but their whole message is, love the one in front of you. And I think that's a good place to start. You don't start by having a thousand churches and hunt thousands of orphans in your care. You start by basically recognizing the one in front of you and loving them. So number one, as a church, we start out by loving the person in front of us and praying for them. That Ted Wise was at a very challenging time in his life and his wife prayed for him. So I want to encourage you to be thinking this week, is there someone that God is drawing your attention to? So I think that it's not just randomly picking a name, but pray, God, is there someone that you want me to notice this week? Maybe you're at Walmart and you notice somebody in the line in front of you. Maybe you are um, at school and you notice someone and God just draws you to them. To pray for that person, to just recognize that person, to invest in that person. Because that's where renewal movements start, is one person loving and praying for one person. The second thing is... Christian community. You can go to the next one. I think my slides are a little bit off. I should change what I'm talking about. But I'm going to just talk about this quickly and then I'll finish with the last two things. That sometimes it gets discouraging. And I think that Pastor McDonald at the Baptist Church in Mill Valley probably got frustrated that his church wasn't growing and more influential. But when you think about it, his church basically started the biggest movement of the last 51 years by loving one person. Sometimes it's you get frustrated, you look around, you think there should be more people at church. And why do we even preach? Why do we even invite people to church? Because we're not growing the way that we want to be growing. And just a reminder that John McDonald, the pastor there, had no idea the impact that was going to come out of that. That in Isaiah it says, So my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to be empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. What was it that transformed Ted Wise? Reading the Bible. We simply love the person in front of us, we pray for the person in front of us, and we trust the power of the Word to change lives. But the second thing that I want to encourage us, and this is going to come up as we talk more about the Jesus people, is the Christian community. That's a big part of who they are. If they didn't have that Christian community, they wouldn't have experienced the depth of what God wanted them to experience. And they wouldn't have been in a place where they would have recognized Lonnie Frisbee and mentored him. They wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a community for him to come in and actually be mentored to become the person who's going to transform our country and the world in the next 50 years after that. So, Christian community, yes, come on Sunday morning, but they realized they also needed something more. They needed people they, can, they could pray with, they could, hold, or they could do service and love their neighbor together with. So to think, how can we create more places where we can have that kind of Christian community, where we can impact people like Lonnie Frisbee who aren't in the church building? And finally, the last thing is 
To trust that God can show up in places that are least expected. Whether it's that person that you think is the least likely to have their life transformed, they're the one that we should be praying for. Um, but also to be praying for our, our nation. It's easy to just shut off the news and give up and think there's nothing that's going to happen. But what does God say? God shows up in unexpected places. Is anything too difficult for God? If God can start the greatest renewal movement in the last 51 years in San Francisco in 1967 among the hippies, ought we not as a church be praying that God can start the same kind of movement today? among Democrats and Republicans, <laughs> among whatever is going on in our community today and the challenges. Because ultimately it will start with God moving individuals to love individuals and to experience God's power bringing the transformation that human power cannot bring. Amen. <laughs>